This presentation explains the relationship between the shortening of a member, a postension member, at stressing and the strength of the member in bending. You become familiar with the importance of shortening of a postension member under jacking force. You learn the impact of support restraint of postension members on members' bending strength. Correct. There is a relationship between support restraint and a member's moment capacity. You find out about the difference between the responses of bonded and unbonded postension members to restraint of uh, the supports. Also understand the impact of support restraint and walls in post-tension multi-story buildings. Finally, you evaluate the difference between post members that are Now, you evaluate the difference between the post-tensioned and pre-tensioned members when it comes to support uh, restraint. Also, there I meant you also at the end become somewhat familiar with the difference between bonded and unbonded post in connection to the restraint of the support. This is what I wanted also to add in the previous uh, slide. Now, let us review the shortening between pre-compression, the relationship between pre-compression and shortening. The diagram on the right shows the common relationship between a cylinder, concrete cylinder, that is uh, post-sentient, and the shortening of it is U. U is the shortening, and P is the pre-compression. And as you see, this is the common uh, well-known curve. You cannot have P along here without a U. There must be a relationship between the two. One does not exist without the other. There would be no pre-compression in the member if there is no displacement U. This is what the curve shows. For the common member shown in C at the bottom, the same phenomenon applies. Precompression in the member F is related to a shortening U. This is something obvious. This is something you know, but I am emphasizing it because it is the core of what is going to follow. Now, figures A through C show the concept of uh, post-tensioning if the member is on rollers here. When pre-compression is applied at the jacking force, there will be a shortening and the pre-compression results, the jacking force results in pre-compression. That is the case where the member is uh, on rollers, as shown in C. If the member doesn't, if the supports do not allow the member to freely shorten under the jacking force, a fraction of the jacking force will be diverted to the support. And that is something which I like to focus on this uh, to find out what is the consequence of that. The following explains the impact of loss of force to the supports on member strength. Figure A is 
on roller supports. The entire pre-compression goes, the entire force goes into the member as pre-compression. There will be force divided by A pre-compression in the member. In B, figure B, the, there are support restraints. Some of the force from post tensioning is diverted to the supports, some or all depending on the restraint of the supports. If you have full restraint, all is diverted to the supports and you will have no uh, pre-compression from uh, post tensioning. Shrinkage of concrete can result in through cracks as I have shown over in here. If you have a support restraints at the first elevated post slab over the foundation, that is where the supports at the far end are attached to the foundation. If the supports are flexible during to, uh, as a result of pre-compression, they will also bend and they may develop uh, some uh, cracks. Where the supports are stiff, as shown at the bottom here, the pre-compression largely escapes into the supports and there will be little pre-compression in the slab. The insufficient pre-compression in the member can lead to through cracks as shown here. Now, how do through cracks from, from shrinkage look like? Restraint cracks are generally long. They can extend through the entire span and go beyond from maybe one end of the member uh, slab to the other side of the slab, from one side to the other side. Restraint cracks go through the depth of the member. They are visible at the top and also visible at the uh, bottom, as I have shown here on the left. The one on the right is indicative of st uh, strength cracks due to large load and uh, bending moment. Now let us review the strength of a member and restraint of the support. First, we will look at a member shown top right that is a roller support. So the entire post tensioning will be diverted into the member at the stressing. We will review the adequacy of this member in, in light of the post tensioning it has. And then we move into one uh, where there is support restraint. To investigate the response, I have made a cut at the center and shown the left one half of the member. In the first one half of the member, the forces at the cut will be a compression and a tension at the cut and a shear. On the right, I have shown the demands at the cut section. The way we investigate the adequacy of a member, strength adequacy of the member, we make a cut or we consider a section at the section, we determine how much is the demand of force. Then we look at the face of the cut and see whether adequate resistance 
can be developed to meet the demand. If we develop adequate resistance, then the member obviously is safe, not uh, otherwise. Now, we evaluate this at mid-span of uh, the member. In this part, I have shown the cut section and the demand at the end, the force at the cut. The demand is shown on the right. The demand at the cut consists of shear, moment, and axial. These should be in equilibrium with the actions at the cut piece here. Here, let us concentrate and view the value of these actions. There will be a shear which comes from this here. There will be a moment which comes from here. There will be an axial force which also comes from here. The critical item for you is what is the value of the axial force? And I really like to pause and let you think for a second and conclude yourself that it is zero. This is important to recognize. The axial force on the demand side is zero because there is no axial force external to what we see. Obviously, there are stresses in the member, there is compression in the member, but the applied loads are up and down. And this load goes directly into the slab. So there is no axial load. Good. I have V, M, and axial a lot. Then for it to be safe, the demand is compared against the resistance here. On the resistance side, obviously I have a shear, I have a compression in concrete, and I have a tension here. Now, Ten, uh, there is no axial force here, so the sum of these two forces must uh, add up uh, to zero. So tension is equal to compression, and the moment is equal to tension times this distance. I conclude that uh, the entire force T in the strand is used in developing the bending moment M is equal to T times Z. Because there is no net horizontal force, T must be equal to C. That is what I have here. So the moment is equal to this times this. This is uh, the basic. Now we go to the upper case. We go to the other case, to the other uh, case. Now that is uh, just repetition, what I just mentioned, that the uh, moment is equal to tension times Z. So the entire force of the tendon is uh, utilized to develop the bending moment. This is not the case where the member has a restraint. Some of the force T, will be diverted to the support. This is how we will look at now. Uh, I have shown the member on supports and that have restraint. When jacking force is applied, some of the force goes into the walls that are shown here. Some of the force is diverted to the walls. In part B, Conceptually, part B represents the restraint of the balls by way of these uh, springs. The moment which will 
because at center I have not shown because I believe it is not consequential to the discussion we have. Because the wall is a little bit eccentric, there would be a little moment there too. But that doesn't alter the conclusion we are going to arrive at. We investigate the demand actions at mid-span here and the resistance that is provided by the cut here at the mid-span. So we find the demand, we compare the demand with the resistance. For safety, the demand and the resistance should match. Now, on the demand side, typically you have shear, moment, and axial. These are the three. Now, these three must be in equilibrium with the forces that act on the cut section. This is how we calculate the demand. We add up the forces on the cut section and then uh, consider them as a demand. The value of demand forces is determined from the actions on the cut section. From equilibrium of the actions here on the cut, we see that there must be n the on the demand side must be equal to f3 because there's an f3 here. f3 is the force diverted to the support. So n is equal to f3. Then we come to the equilibrium of this demand uh, cut section with the resistance developed at the face. The resistance developed at the face obviously must be in equilibrium with the demand here. Here I have a force C here. I have force F3 in the horizontal direction and I have another force F2 here. So this is the equation for the sum of forces in the horizontal uh, direction. Then uh, we note from this equation that compression C is equal to force F2, which is the force in tandem, minus F3, force diverted to the support. So in summary, the contribution of tendon force F2, tendon force F2, is reduced by the amount of the force diverted to the support F3. C, the contribution of F2, is reduced by F3. And it is C times Z that... Uh, is a component of moment developed at the face of the support. The, pre the preceding presentation illustrates that there is consider a consideration for the strength response of post-tension members that at stressing are restrained at the supports. The diversion of the jacking force to the restraints lessens the precompression in the member from post-tensioning. Post there will be less precompression because some of the force has diverted to the support. The diversion results in reduction of moment capacity of the member. That concludes the question of the impact of restraint at the supports on the moment capacity of the member. And the conclusion was that the support restraints reduce the moment capacity of the section because the contribution of tendon force is for moment capacity is reduced by the amount of the force that diverts to the supports. Now, in what follows, I am concentrating a little bit on is there a difference between uh, bonded and 
unbounded construction when it comes to restraint of the supports and if there is what is the difference and also uh, what happens next after we have restraint of the support to full extent and we load the member this is uh, i would say a segment this section that i'm going to talk about but not critical because the conclusion that was the focus of this presentation was arrived at at the previous slides now let us look at the response of an unbonded tendon and in this case i have idealized the tendon to be straight for simplicity of explanation and i have assumed that all the force has uh, uh, been diverted to the far ends and uh, a shrinkage has resulted in a through crack as shown here From the preceding concludes that at full support restraint the tendon tension force doesn't contribute to the moment capacity the following covers other contributions of tendons to moments moment capacity besides the pre-compression now what else does the tendon provide first we review the performance of unbonded tendon and then we move to a uh, bonded figure a shows an unbonded tendon reinforced it illustrates the a through crack and it also uh, shows that under applied load uh, we i have envisaged a collapse mechanism as uh, shown here breaking into uh, parts now here is the uh, collapse mechanism and i am showing the diagram for the force on a one half of the member on the less left half of the member figure a the force f in the tendon the force f in the tendon at the location of through crack here there is a force f must be equal to the, this force f in the diagram that i have shown here is the restraint here is the roller so this force here must be equal to this force at uh, initiation at the, the for the diagram shown at the top before actually we apply the load but at failure mode envisaged in b contact is established at the top of the crack tendon force at the crack increases to f2 f2 here and f2 now will be because of equilibrium here uh, what uh, we had before plus an extra delta f f2 is increased by amount of uh, delta f the force at the support changes from f to f4 before we had a force uh, here and now we have it in also increased the stretching here result to an increase in this uh, force also c shows the free body diagram of the left side of the member for the failure uh, envisaged again i have shown the failure diagram at the top uh, right d here shows the demand for this construction here the demand again is shear axial and uh, moment in this uh, diagram the axial force must be equal to f4 these are there's the, this is the only axial force here we are not con this doesn't come into the equation on the demand this is on the resistance side so writing the now coming to the equilibrium of this entire section on the left i have c 
which is uh, pointing to the uh, left uh, must be equal to f2 uh, minus uh, f4 that is what I have from the equilibrium here and the moment that can uh, develop is c times the lever r but c itself is f2 minus f4 this is what I have here at the uh, bottom f2 minus f4 let us look at the lowest diagram this is f4 this is f2 f2 minus f4 is p which is the friction force along the tendon so uh, f2 minus f4 again i have uh, repeated it here for ease of uh, viewing and from the foregoing the moment that can develop at the face of through crack at ultimate limit state is limited by the friction between the tendon and its uh, sheathing f2 minus f4 was p this is the only force that uh, we have now uh, let us move uh, beyond and look at uh, the situation of an bonded tendon in an unbonded tendon as shown in here with the support uh, restraints at stressing the green will be the distribution of force in tendon for an unbonded member with through crack figure b shows the distribution of tendon force at service condition this is at service condition and the red is at ultimate limit condition if you load it to failure of a member the force here at the crack will increase there will be friction between the crack and the end and the force diagram will look like this so this is the force diagram at ultimate this is the force diagram at uh, uh, stressing so the net force which is available is this the maximum force here minus this what goes here so the short the c the compression must be okay good now sorry for interruption here good f u is the ultimate force in tendon f u is the ultimate force f4 is the force at the anchorage c compression that can develop is the difference between these two that is the compression that can develop and uh, from b fu minus f4 is friction p that can develop between the strand and its sheathing this is this curve which is the friction force from the foregoing the moment that can develop at the through crack is limited by the friction force between the tendon and its sheathing this is the scenario if we have full restraint of the support otherwise there will be slightly different now look at the bonded situation for a bonded member with through crack b shows the distribution of uh, force in tendon at the location of uh, crack prior to application of load to break the member if load is increased and the member is going to break here 
the force locally tendon stretching through the gap increases the tendon force by delta F2. This will be local increase in tendon force at the crack because the strand is bonded and there will be no stretching far away from the location of the crack. Figure D shows the demand forces, moment, shear axial, and the resistance developed at the through crack. Demand, like before, is shear moment axial. The resistance is a compression in the compression force. And there is a force F2 that we had and an increase in F2, delta F2. So this is the force at the cut, uh, at the location F2 plus delta F2. The compressive force C that can develop at the crack for resisting the moment from equilibrium of segment shown in D, from equilibrium of this segment, gives us is C, compressive force, is equal to these other three added together. C is equal to the other three. Since F2 and F3 are equal, the available tension to develop the resisting moment is equal to the local increase in tendon force delta F2. So delta F2, the local increase, will be there available to resist the demand uh, moment. So in summary, I have uh, a member shown here with a through crack from restraint of total restraint of the support. And at the bottom, I show in blue the uh, unbonded response and the red uh, bonded response. In blue, the on uh, now. B shows the force diagram of the tendon at ultimate limit state. For unbonded tendon, the force available in tendon is Fu minus F4. This is uh, uh, for unbonded. The force in the member, this is the unbonded. The, at the cut, the force will be this. Then this is the friction in the member and the force at the restraint is a four. So really the difference between the force here at the crack and the force at the far end, this is available for resisting the moment. This is what I had as friction in Friction in the member can provide the moment uh, capacity and no more. For bonded section, uh, we have uh, uh, for bonded section, uh, the available force is the total increase in tendon, tendon force, delta FB. Uh, delta FB, this is what is available to resist the bending moment at the ultimate uh, limits state. So that uh, brings me the uh, uh, brings me to the conclusion between the bonded and unbonded uh, system and the consequence of restraint of support on the moment capacity of the member. Now I'm going through one or two examples. This is the reflected ceiling of a post-tensioned slab with tendons left, right, and tendons up to down on perimeter walls. This is a subterranean or the first level structure. The 
through cracks that are shown here, through cracks indicate that the precompression from the tendons along the longitudinal direction are totally diverted to the walls. There is no precompression here between the supports. Now, the uplift from the tendon profile is there. The force is in tendon. The uplift is there. So you have not lost the contribution of force tensioning in reducing the demand moment resulting from the profile of tendon, but you you uh, but you lose the contribution in precompression, which is very important. Shrinkage leads to transfers through cracks. There is no precompression in the central region. The contribution of force tensioning to the strength of the central region of the floor is essentially lost. When you go to a multi-story building, which I have tried to show in an ide idealized manner, the loss of free compression is most pronounced at the first elevated upper levels. At upper levels, the loss of precompression to the supports below compensates somewhat by what? Now, at upper levels, the loss of precompression to the supports below is compensated when the level above is post tension. So the loss is not as dramatic, and eventually there will be no loss. So the focus of consideration is uh, the first elevated and a little bit the second, maybe third, not at the upper levels. In common construction, the restraint of supports for the upper levels is not accounted for. Now, what is the case if uh, uh, you have a structure with stiff walls as I have shown here what happens uh, for in the region between uh, the walls part of the floor precompression from the perimeter region will be diverted part of the precompression will be diverted into the walls but beyond the walls this diversion will come back into the slab. The precompression diverted to the walls is regained by the slab beyond the interior of the end wall here and here. At the first elevated floor here, the post-tensioning diverted to the foundation is not recovered. And that is where we have to take a look at it more closely and take a, a special consideration. The safety of the slab on the sides of the wall is enhanced by the presence of the wall. What I'm trying to say here that when you lose pre-compression from here to here, the consequence is not dire because the presence of the wall contributes to the support and the strength in this direction. It is over here where we have only column where the presence of precompression is more critical. Now, in summary, what did we cover? We talked about relationship between shortening of a member at stressing and precompression in the member shortening if restraint takes some of the precompression that otherwise would go to the member the necessary contribution of precompression from post tensioning to members bending is strength the precompression which is diverted to the support reduces the moment capacity 
of the member. We talked about the importance of support restraints against member shortening and stressing, formation of restraint cracks and their features and consequence that they are long, they go through the slab, impact of restraint crack on the strength of unbonded, and then impact on the strength of uh, bonded attendance. And we made a comparison between the response of unbonded and bonded tendons when it comes to restraint of the supports and then covered a couple of uh, examples. Thank you for uh, listening. The material presented here was extracted from a chapter of this book shown on the right.